Beautiful. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, and please turn your Bibles to Proverbs 4, chapters 20 to 23. I'm going to read from the King James Version. Proverbs 4, from 20 to 23. These are very deep words that the Lord gave us here. My son, attend to my words. Incline thy ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thy eyes. Keep them into the midst of thy heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all of their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Amen. This morning, in our scripture reading, part of our scripture reading there, in verse 23 from the NIV says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the well spring of life. You know, uh, I don't know, I've been fascinated here lately with the subject about the heart, and I've been studying into it, and uh, the heart is mentioned perhaps more than any other subject in the Bible. And uh, like I shared with you here a couple of weeks ago, several people tried to share with us and define what it does it mean when the Scripture speaks of the heart. I like what this man has to say. He says, the heart is used in Scripture as the most comprehensive term for the authentic person. In fact, in, in reality, it's talking about the real you, what makes you tick, the inner core, the inner being of who you are. I wonder this morning, what does God see when he looks into your heart? What does he see when he looks into my heart? Does he see a good heart? Does he see a pure heart? Is it possible even to have a good heart? Hey, you must have been here for first service. <laughs> and Jeremiah, here's one scripture, and I believe this scripture is true, but... You know, is there another flip side to the coin? In Jeremiah 17, verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Have you ever seen a good heart, a pure heart? You know, all of us have traveled down the road, and we've seen people stranded, out of gas, their car didn't work, and we stopped, and we tried to help them out, you know, with their situation. I was in Chicago here a few weeks ago, and I had one of these little cards that you purchase, and I put about $20 worth of uh, bus riding on it, and uh, I didn't realize it, but my card was pretty much used up. It was $1 short. I looked in my billfold, and all I had was 20s, and a lady be behind me says, here, here's a buck to put into the machine. Now, did she do that out of deceitfulness and wickedness, or did she do that out of the goodness of her heart she did it out of the goodness of her heart I believe now don't get me wrong I think there is a lot of uh, wicked hearts out there but we see random acts of kindness in 1928 at the Olympics uh, there was a man by the name of Henry Pierce and Henry Pierce was from Australia and he had his oars and he was digging in for all it was worth trying to make that boat go ahead of, uh, ahead of the crowd he was after the goal and then all of a sudden, he um, sees a duck and its ducklings, you know, paddling, and they're headed for a collision course. And he's going to sink some ducklings unless they get out of the way or something happens. And he takes his oars and he stops paddling. He stops paddling. The duck and the ducklings pass because he was afraid he was going to sink a few ducklings. And as soon as the ducklings are gone, he takes those oars, puts them back into the water, and he digs for all that it's worth and he gets the gold. My friends, I believe that he didn't do it because he had a wicked, uh, desperately wicked heart or deceitful heart. He did it out of the kindness of his heart, out of the goodness of his heart. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe that text is true. Uh, and when we look at our world, we can certainly see some deceitfulness going on. Maybe you heard about that man that won the lottery. I mean, he won big. He was a multi-millionaire. All of a sudden, he gets a letter from a lady he hadn't seen for a while, and the letter says, Dearest Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I've felt since breaking our engagement. <laughs> Please say you'll take me back. 
No one could ever take your place in my heart, so please forgive me. I love you, I love you, I love you. Yours forever, Marie. P.S. And congratulations on winning the state lottery. There might possibly be a little bit of deceitfulness there. My friends, when we watch the news at night on television or we read the newspaper, we certainly see wickedness and we see deceitfulness and we see darkness and, and people walking without hope. We certainly see these things in our world. It's amazing to me. You and I were created in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, in the likeness of God. We were created in His image. And that's not just talking about the physical, it's talking about our innermost being, our characters, our, the real deal, the real you. But it's amazing, by the time you get into Genesis chapter 6, we've gone downward, downward, until God's, God is uh, sorry that He ever made us. Here in the book of Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart now I think we all could confess if we're honest that deep down inside of us you know the beast can come out we still have a sinful nature, you know. We still have a nature inside of us that can be a scrooge at times. And you know what? There is not a preacher alive that can tell me to shape up enough that's going to really make me shape up. There is not anyone out there that can tell me to clean up my act or try harder to make it right and make me really right on the inside. I mean, stop and think about it. The Jews try to keep the law. The Buddhists... They follow the eightfold path. The Muslims, they live by the five pillars. And many Christians live moral lives and attend church. You would think with all of that, we'd be living in utopia by now. That there wouldn't be any war on the earth. But we need something a whole lot deeper than just trying to be good. I'm not knocking good for goodness sake but I'm I'm saying there's got to be something because you know if I try to tell my child or if I try to tell someone you better start trying harder to be good <clears throat> you know they can try for a while but it won't last it's got to be something deeper than that that goes and happens on the inside and sometimes we can be very Christian or think we are and I think we've all fallen into this trap in fact I think that we've We've been a Sadducee, we've been a Pharisee, we've been everything in between at one time or another to some degree. I think of Victor Troop. He was a call porter years ago. I was a district leader in southern Illinois, and he was in my district. And he was a, just a brand new church member, a brand new Christian who was on fire for God. He loved the Lord. He beamed with the Lord. But I was at his place one evening, and he was at the kitchen table, and he was sobbing. Things hadn't been going that great in the call porter work and selling the Bible stories. Financially, he was struggling. But he was on fire for God and had this little church that he went to, about 25 people on Sabbath. And he went there and they were going to take up the offering. And there wasn't any deacons there that day and nobody was coming up to pick up the plate. So he thought he'd do a favor and come and pick up the plate. I might have told you this before, but to me, I'll never forget it because his heart was broken. And I saw him there. And so anyway, he uh, shares this story. And after he, he picks up the plate and helps take up the offering, they have to call a board meeting and discipline him because he was not an ordained deacon. Well, where is that at in the Bible? And where is that in any rule book? If that's, you know, there's got to be more to religion than just that kind of stuff going on. You know what I mean? There's got to be something deeper inside. We can do a lot of good things, and they might be good, but what is the heart really like? Jesus talked to the religious people of his time. He spoke to them, and I think he said this with tears in his voice, though it's pretty harsh words, it seems, on the surface. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of a cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, 
first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also now God's not knocking the things they're doing it's the motive and all the things behind it and where the heart really is you know they we can stand they've stood on street corners praying and they you know looked like they were all shriveled up fasting and boy tithe oh man they would even tithe their herbs Sabbath keepers some of the best Sabbath keepers you could find but they nailed the creator of the universe on a cross and Jesus goes on woe to you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for you are like whitewashed tombs which in indeed appear beautiful outwardly but inside are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanliness even so you also outwardly appear righteous to man but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness I don't want to be playing any charade I don't want to be a pretender I want to be the real McCoy and I know you want to be the real McCoy too and someone might say maybe you're visiting someone that used to come to church and they'll say that that's exactly why I don't go to church that's why I don't go to church there's just too many hypocrites there you know you feel like saying well hey don't let that stop you there's always room for one more <laughs> I wonder if we've misdiagnosed the disease the problem isn't what's happening on the outside the problem is what's happening on the inside oh friends you know the Bible tells us Jesus says for out of the heart comes evil thoughts murder adultery sexual immorality theft false testimony and slander it's not enough just to look good on the outside to polish up my my manners it's not good enough to just to upgrade or tweak this and tweak that what we need is a transformation what we need is a heart transplant we need a miracle we need Jesus Christ that's what we need Jesus is called many things in Scripture and that's beautiful it gives us an idea of what his personality is like who he is he's called the Lion of Judah He's called the bright and morning star. He's called the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace. He's called the lamb of God. Each title, each name gives us an eye opener to who he is and what he's all about. Now there's one that we don't hear a lot of, but it is an awesome one because it opens up volumes to us who Jesus is. He is called the last Adam. Paul calls him the last Adam. He calls him the second man. What in the world does he mean by that? What can we take from that? What can we understand from that? We all know what happened to the first Adam, don't we? That's why we're in the mess that we're in. That's why we let each other down. That's why we see so much crime and violence and unhappiness in our world. We were meant to be kings and queens. We were meant to be rulers of this creation we were to bear the glorious image of a glorious God and yet Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5 verse 12 that sin entered the world sin entered the world and I you know I'm glad it doesn't stop there if you have your Bibles you might might want to turn to this in Matt Romans chapter 5 verse 19 this is what Paul has to say for just as through the disobedience of the one man, talking about Adam, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, that is Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Did the first Adam, Adam have an impact on the human race? Did the second Adam have a greater impact? He had a greater impact his life his death his resurrection you know we hear this information and we hear it and we hear it but do we really hear it Jesus said they have eyes but they see not Jesus said they have ears but they hear not how far has it gone deep down inside of us here in Romans chapter 5 verse 17 Paul says something beautiful here for if by the trespass of the one man that is Adam death reigned through that one man oh I love these next three three words so much how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace 
and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. What Adam did to the human race, Christ undid for the human race. We are told in the book of Isaiah that he came, and we're told this in the book of Luke, that he came to set the prisoners free, to set the captives free. Awesome, good news. Now, is it possible for you and I to have a pure heart, a good heart? Now, it must be because God wouldn't tell us to do something that isn't possible. It is, all things are possible through him. He tells us to love the Lord our God with all our heart. And if we don't have a divided heart, then it means that we can't have a wicked heart. Because Christ, why? Because notice what Paul says. His prayer to the Ephesians, his prayer to the Christians, is that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, if Christ is living in my heart through faith, that's an awesome thought. Do we really capture that? And are we conscious of it? If we've accepted Jesus into our hearts, I remember, uh, I wouldn't want to tell you everything of what I was like. Maybe I will when the last Sabbath I'm here. I might tell you some more. <laughs> I used to work at this locker plant, and they valued me because I have always, through God's grace, been a good worker. Even when I didn't know God, I was a good worker, and I had a reputation for that. But I should have been fired for the, some of the things that I did there and the way I acted at times. After I found Jesus, and I came back to that locker plant to work for just a couple of weeks, three weeks, as I prepared myself for the call porter work, selling our literature, they said... Uh, the boss and I was praying the whole time I was there God help me to reflect you and every moment I was thinking God help me to shine out for you help me put me aside and just let you shine and you know what my boss said to me at the end of those three weeks he says what happened to you you're a different person you're a different person I would tell you why he said that but I'm not going to right now <laughs> maybe someday that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a what? New. New. New creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The Bible calls it being born again. You know, we think it's a unbelievable thing we think it's a miracle that the incarnation jesus was born as a baby uh in uh, with mary you know it's just amazing what's amazing he does that every day he does it in people's hearts every single day in galatians chapter 2 verse 20 he says i am crucified with christ paul says nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me Paul had a personal experience with Jesus Christ it wasn't just head knowledge it went a whole lot further than that yes I realize we're sinful and I've got this nature and sometimes you know what that we see things come out of the nature that if we're not careful if we don't guard our hearts you know, the old man can come back into place. And so we got to be careful. we got to guard this heart. And how do you guard a heart? I'll tell you about that in a moment. But we do have good hearts if we've accepted Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, Jesus says. Is it possible to have a pure, clean heart according to Jesus? Now, make no mistake about it. Don't misunderstand me. We're a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. I love what the Apostle John says. He acknowledges this. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Don't you like that? Now we are the sons of God. Now we're the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be what? Everything that was lost in the garden is being restored and has been restored through the, our Creator, Jesus Christ. That is so awesome. For we shall see Him as He is. But you say, Pastor, man, I tell you, I blow it. I did this, and I said this, and I fought this. And you know what Paul has to say? 
He says this in Philippians 1, 6. Don't give up, have hope because of this. Be confident of this, Paul says, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What an awesome God we have. And so, how are you today in guarding your heart? You know, if Christ is living in your, our hearts by faith, can you think of a, any greater treasure than one could have than that, if that's a reality? And I believe it's a reality. When I use the word if, I'm not saying if. It really is a reality. Can you imagine? I heard of a man that took his life savings, everything he had, his treasure, and he had it on the front seat of the car with the windows rolled down. How careful are you with your treasure? How careful are you with you, your heart? Are you guarding your heart? And you know, that's another thing. If we didn't have a good heart, then there wouldn't be anything to guard. If we've accepted Jesus as our Savior and Lord, if he lives in our hearts by faith, uh, if we had nothing but a wicked, desperate, deceitful heart, there's nothing to guard. But because we have accepted Jesus, we need to be guarding our heart. We need to be guarding this treasure that lives in our heart by faith. Are you careful about how you treat your heart? What do you do on a daily basis to protect your heart? What do you do? You know, I, it's all right to eat a few sweets now and then, but if I spent my every day of my life eating cookies and french fries and I love Snickers candy bars. If I spent all my life eating that stuff, what do you think my arteries are going to look like? What do you think my heart's going to look like? What have you been putting in your heart? Not the physical, but I mean, you're going to need to watch that too, but also the spiritual. That's definitely more important. What have you been putting into your heart? What have you been putting there? You know, it's important. Oh, what do you do daily? Oh, I don't exercise. I, I, I just eat candy bars and french fries. What do you do? Junk food kills, and they tell us that we are what we eat. John, Jesus had this to say in the book of John. He says, I am the bread of life. Do you believe that this morning? He says, if anyone eats of this bread, the word of God, he will live forever. Yes, it's awesome. It's incredible. I am the bread of life. I don't know how many times the Bible talks about the word, and Jesus is the word, and he says that we need to be eating him, the bread of life. He says here in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word. Is it important to be in the word? You know, it is. There is power in the word. By the word of God, the worlds were created. By the word of God, the blind were able to see. By the word of God, the deaf were able to hear. By the word of God, the dead came out of the graves. My friends, there is power in the word of God. He says, I am the bread of life. And the word was what made flesh and what dwelt among us. And not only does he dwell among us, but he dwells in us by faith. In Job chapter 23 it says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Paul feels the same way. Paul says in Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it dwell in you. You know what? The word of God. God is love. His word is love. And he wants that love to dwell in us by faith faith that's what really counts it's important the word of god you know when you open up this book you can't just read it like another book you got to pray you got to say god open up my eyes let me see your love in these pages let me see your character and then please implant it into me put it within me the psalmist says i have hidden your word in my heart that i might not sin against you Jesus sees the woman at the well. She's squirming over here trying to find happy, happiness. She's frustrated and agitated, and she's squirming over here to try to find happiness. And Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks this water, the water of this world, will be thirsty again. But whosoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. 
Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. I wonder this morning, what have you been feeding on? What have you been letting go, go on into your eyes and ears and into your mind and into your heart? My friends, input determines output. What have you been storing up? And is there anything in there that is good? I mean, if some brother, some sister at work or around me is in darkness and they're despondent and they're in depression and they come seeking something from me, do I have anything stored up in my heart to offer them? Or am I just barely, you know, pumping out a little trickle of water? God wants us to be a wellspring of water, it says in Proverbs chapter 4. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus says, The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. What have you been storing in your heart this morning? And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Oh, this morning that we could have the experience of Jeremiah when we read the word of God. I wish we would stay with the word of God until the spirit comes until some little gem, and you know that God has turned the light bulb on, that's God's little love message for you for that day. Jeremiah said, His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I can not. The reason he couldn't hold it in is because he had that agape love. You know, he, want, he was filled up. I don't know how filled up he was, but it was pretty filled up. Why was it like a fire to him? Because he understood God's love. Or he wouldn't be able to pin these words. Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. You know why a, a, a good person with a good heart does good things? Because they, the Bible says we love him because he us when we realize the love of god not just the information of it because we've heard it and we've heard it oh boy yeah jesus came to the earth yeah he died born a baby blah 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 it's got to really click somewhere it's really got to come on the purpose of reading god's word is that christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye be rooted and grounded in love the purpose of God's word is to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. Yeah, there you go again. God's love, 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 love. Could you pass the potato chips, please? Incredible. We can stand in the very presence of God and his love, but it doesn't somehow get inside. It doesn't go down deep. The greatest distance in the world, someone said, is the distance between the head and the heart. For many, the love of God, we know it, we can spit it out of our mouths, we can tell people about it, but to be touched with the love of God, that's what counts. We stand in the very presence of God, but is it getting through? And this last days, God is knocking. He's knocking. He's knocking on the door. Is he getting through? It's so easy to drift. You can lose that first love. Have you ever lost the first love? God says, come back. I'm knocking on your door. Maybe you've heard the story of Helen Keller. I'm sure you've all heard of Helen Keller. Maybe you saw the movie, the old one, back in 62. They made a movie called The Miracle Worker. And so anyway... Helen Keller at that time was a little brat, in my opinion. <laughs> the way they portrayed her on the movie, she was frustrated, she was agitated, she was uh, a very excitable little girl. She squirmed over here and she squirmed over there, and they hired Ann Sullivan to help Helen Keller. Helen Keller was blind, she was deaf, and so anyway, Ann Sullivan developed a little code, and she would tap on... Uh, Helen Keller's hand to try to communicate with her, but somehow it wasn't getting through, and she just couldn't get through. Later on, Helen Keller said that I thought she was just playing with my hand when she was tapping code, tapping code into my hand. I thought she was just playing. I didn't know. 
I just didn't know. And one day, Helen was very unruly, and Anne took her outside and started pumping water at the pump. And she started tapping on her hand, tapping on her hand, pumping the water on one hand and tapping on the other, and all of a sudden, the lights came on. You're trying to communicate with me. You're trying to tell me what this water is. And she gets all excited and she runs over here and grabs some flowers and puts them in her hand. And Helen Keller, or uh, Anne taps her on the hand. And she runs here and she runs there, brings it back. And again, Anne taps code into her hand. She is so excited. God, for 23 years, was tapping code on my hand. He was tapping code into my heart. I love you, Keith. I love you, Keith. I want to give you the abundant life, Keith. I want you to find what you've been squirming for. I want you to find what you've been looking for. And it finally, the light came on. Has the light come on for you? Is it just intellectual doctrine? Is it just information? Is it just like Mr. Spock on Star Trek, kind of cold and factual? Or is it something that's real, something that's deep? I like what Helen Keller said later on in her life. She said, the best and most beautiful things in the world could not be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. And that's what God wants us to do today. He wants us to come into the, a deep, deep experience where we feel it and sense it and believe it, not just with the head, but we sense it with our innermost being. He wants us to be filled with the fullness of agape love. That's what Jesus is all about. And he's standing and he's knocking on the door in these last days. And so my prayer for each and every one of us today is that we might be rooted and grounded in love, that we would be filled with the fullness of God. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. Lord, help your love to ignite us. Somehow help us to rediscover this love and help us to appreciate it like we've never appreciated it before. We can't truly love you like we should until we realize how much you love us. We love you because you first loved us. Nobody can come to the Father unless you draw us. I love you with an everlasting love. With uh, loving kindness, I have drawn thee. Help us, Lord, to be so filled up that we will become like a wellspring of water, refreshing others in their darkness and despair and depression. Help us to be your wellspring today. Help us to guard our hearts. Help us not to drift into the world. Help us, not to, help us to be careful about what comes through our eyes, what comes through our ears. Help us to keep our treasure. Help us not to put it out on the front seat with the windows rolled down. For we ask it in Jesus' name.